Warp Core Breach, Episode 36, Quick Change. Captain, enemy ships decloaking off report bow. They're charging weapons. Shields up, red alert. They're firing. Containment failure detected. Warp Core Breach imminent. Welcome to Warp Core Breach. On this episode, Nick and David discuss reformatting the show, resurrecting crew from the Genesis planet, and we all discuss rebooting torpedoes. The Faction Report analyzes the best factions for early and late game. Wouldn't it be nice if we had some interesting retail card packs? Griffin faces the siege. And finally, we all share our thoughts on what faction we'd use to teach someone how to play. Warning. Warp core breach detected. I'm David Montgomery, and here's my co-host, the Data, to Michael Rami. I busted him up! I never knew that playing to a draw was actually a valid strategy. Sometimes the only winning move is not to play. Except when it comes to Star Trek Attack Wing, because the winning move is to play, and play, and play some more. I don't know, I, I've actually improved my odds of winning by getting a buy several times. <laughs> but I mean, as opposed to not playing at all. Oh, yeah, sure. <laughs> that That is very true. Yeah, it, it's been kind of lame. I've, uh, I haven't been getting the first round buy. Well, had that at least once, but I've been getting the second round buy a lot, and I'm like, really? Yeah. It's quite frustrating. It's like, you show up. But you can't leave, mostly because I'm running the tournament. But mm -hmm. also because you got to stick around for round three. Right. It's great if you're just a player and you just want to take off, grab a bite, and come back or something. Or grab a drink or a snack. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, I think the second round buy annoys me the most. Yeah. Because the third round, I could be, you know, putting away my stuff and mm -hmm. be you know, mostly ready to go when we were done, but no. Oh, well, I still had fun. The thing that has been annoying is that whenever I get the buy, I get the least points on the day oh, yeah. from the buy. Yeah. The round, just whatever happens, it's the lowest average <laughs> score that round. Yeah. I wish there was a better way to deal with that, but that's the way it is. Well, in the big tournaments, you just get 100 flat. Yeah. When you have the buy. Which, it's fine, and that's because it would take way too long to calculate the average. Mm. But, I don't know. I, I mean, it's worked out. There hasn't ever been a, a reason why getting the buy is cost a tournament. Uh, except when everyone got the buy and went 1-1-1. One, one, one. Oh, but even then, you're still responsible. Like, you could have gone 2-0. and oh. Right. It just came down to, hey, you lost a match. Like, that's on you. Mm -hmm. You still controlled the points that you got, so. Meh. Say la vie. Yeah, it's what it is. Exactly. So, uh, what have you been up to with Star Trek lately? Uh, we've been having a bit of, bit of a drop in attendance lately due to life and everything else, so we've had a little bit more of a a distilled bit of quality of play in the sense that we've had time we played multiple games with some the same people instead of rotating through like we normally do so i i think there's actually been a little bit of growth for some players and a little bit more diversity for others in in those senses so it's been an interesting shift oh well, that's a good thing mhm mm but this week I'm excited because we're getting everybody back. Uh, some of our irregulars are going to be there, including my father, who's coming into town again, and he's going to be joining us. Awesome. So I'm definitely looking forward. And from what I hear, one of the two fleets he's bringing is going to be Aquatics. Ooh. Yeah. That's always fun. I love that ship. Yeah, hopefully we get another version of the Aquatic, and then that'll be even better. Absolutely. I want at least one retail of each uh, ship to to at least try to flesh out the faction. Yeah. I think that would be fantastic. 
And I, I seem to recall that was the original plan from WizKids, to, re to have one of each of the retails, but things just got shifted a little bit with the revamping uh, releases. But I have a good faith that, uh, you know, with a little bit of time, we will get them. They are on the horizon, as far as I'm concerned. Mm. Crossing my fingers and hoping. You bet it. So, yeah, for me, uh, I got to play Search for Spock on uh, May 7th and ha nice. had a blast with that. We had five people, four of which went two and one. Oh. So that was a big mess of points at the end and just... Who got what, when, and it was it was good. It it was uh, going into the last round. One guy was two and zero, oh, and I had to face him, and I ended up winning. Uh, and oh. so I finally broke my camera losing streak. So I am happy about that. You recorded a victory. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I you know I had a decent record on camera, and then I lost like three in a row, and I'm like, oh, eh, I need to fix that. <laughs> so I, you know I, it, it's the fun thing about having camera matches it's they're mm -hmm. there for posterity but then you can also look back at every dumb thing you did <laughs> uh well speaking of dumb things and trying to avoid them we don't play our search for spock until the 18th so what did you see what did you learn what was fun what was what would you have thrown out so I lost a ship to the planet. Basically, Ooh. it had no damage on it. This is a generic Prometheus with okay. Unimatrix shield on it. So it has four holes, six shields. It takes mm -hmm. a, a shot from fighters, a shot from the Bajoran Interceptor. Mm. And then it's left with two hole, and the planet rolls two hits against it. Oh, and Damn. it's like, wow, what what do you do? Uh, round two, I brought up three crew in the first round. My opponent killed two somehow. And then the planet killed off the last guy. So after one <laughs> round, I had no crew left on the planet. Uh, right. So maybe pulling up three was not the best idea. Uh -huh. Um but captain skill was everything in that game. And not just high captain skill, but having a fluctuation of captain skill. Because being able to get in there early and pull up crew was nice. Mm -hmm. uh, because then it set the tone. But then also having late movement to react and maybe mess with them after they had lowered their shields was another good thing. Oh, yeah. Um, I saw a lot of car being played, actually, because people mm -hmm. wanted the extra dice and the high captain skill. So And the reroll doesn't help, or doesn't hurt yeah, either. No, not at all. I actually <laughs> saw a car on a Keldon with fire, Ooh. The, the elite talent from the new Reliant pack that we kind of lamented. Yeah. It worked, though. That That's a eight-die attack Keldon. Yeah, like I, I was definitely not one to think less of those uh, upgrades. Yeah, I, I, my only concern was the cost, but uh, they worked. You only need them to work once, so there you go. Yeah, and, and that was the thing. So people made really good use of their crew, and having all those extra points in crew really mm -hmm. did a lot. Yeah, so people got to make good use of them? Oh, yeah. Rulot, the guy that came on the Nistrum Kulla booster, was actually a guy somebody took on their away team and just hoped for the best in not pulling the Nistrum Kulla. Uh, and they yeah. didn't. They pulled, I okay. think they pulled Bajoran or No, they got the Lakota. <laughs> yeah, oh. lucky. Um, yeah. But I, I think you can do those things. People took kind of two crew in two different ways. They took mess with opponent guys like Takar and some other stuff. But then they also took quality enhancement crew. So things like um, check off from the refit, where you can reroll your dice, wharf. Uh, For primaries. Yeah, Cooney Voss, stuff like that. Stuff that added 
hits. Um, people brought Bohica. Nobody brought Spock on their away team, but that was kind of curious. And I'm going, he would have worked rather well here. Mm-hmm. So I, I don't know. I, I think there's a ton of room to play with that crew still and a lot. Uh, I do have to share my most frustrating thing. And this is on camera, but if you don't watch it, I pull up Tasha Yar. I put her on my Tokat booster. It's the last mm-hmm. ship alive. So it gets destroyed. I've already lost this game. And I'm like, great, I'm going to get to fire. But I'm like, wait, I have to draw the the damage and the overflow. And I get a stunned helmsman crit. Uh, and I just walk away from no. the table. Because oh, I can't no. take it. I, I'm like, the game hosed me like five times that one that that was the same game where my prometheus class was destroyed it was the same game where i rolled seven dice with the tokat and i rolled one crit and six blanks or battle stations oh and and i'm just like looking around and there's no answers there's there's nothing there it's it's life. Um, and you go, what do you do? There, there's, there's just nothing. Like when you get a stunned helmsman, there's nothing you can do, but, and, and that's one of the, the terrible crits, but the one time it hurts you when it's already destroyed your ship is when you have Tasha sitting there. Yes. Denied, denied, denied. Oh, sympathies, brother. And, and it wouldn't, it, you know, I had already lost the, the the match. There was nothing that was going to change by getting Tasha off, except some more points, because mm-hmm. there was a Keldon with two durability left, right in front of me. So I'm going to get, you know, four dice as long as I roll two hits, which probably wouldn't have happened anyways. But you wanted your chance. I wanted my chance, and I should have had my chance. Uh. This game sometimes, though. Yeah, but honestly, I would rather it be the luck of the draw than it had been something that an opponent had just done massive denial. So it it wasn't like it was something the opponent caused to you. It was just something that happened by chance. Not that I hold grudges against players ever. Just that that way, even for the... that fleeting moment, you're not even thinking of blaming the other opponent. You're just going, damn. It, it was one of those things. I was just like, what can you do? And then, yeah. and then I get the buy right after that. So I'm like, really? This is the reward I get? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, poor guy. But hey, I, you know, you live and I, I rebounded for round three and I had fun. So there you go. That was that was the best thing I could do is uh, go in there, have fun and say, hey, I got nothing to lose by playing this. I was already I was one and one with not nearly enough fleet points to win. There was nothing I could do except go out there and play my best. Yep. So, hey, at least I ended the day on a high note. (laughs) There you go. Uh, Good for you. Good on you, mate. But yeah, General Orders was actually a fun resource to to play with. Yeah, I like that one. Of course, one opponent brought all Borg ships. No. So that was fun. Except then he pulls the Lakota booster. So he's like, ha! ha. I'm like, ha, you have 270 degrees of General Orders coverage. (laughs) He's like, dang it. Ha, that serves you right. I'm like, here, would you like this Tokat? (laughs) because <laughs> you can have it <laughs> you, then there's only 90 degrees of coverage nothing will ever bother you uh, but then again Lakota <laughs> then again Lakota yeah so yeah it works good times good good times yeah I definitely look forward to our kick at the can oh yeah this scenario is a lot of fun though I I really enjoy what it has. And somebody did set up 
facing away from the planet, and their first move was a come about. Uh, nice. So it was a runaway. Granted, they did that with the Bajoran booster. That makes sense, though. Oh yeah, because it's got like a two white come about. So yeah, you can do that move, and you're still within range two to pull something off the planet. Yeah. And as it's a white, you still have your action. Yeah, I thought it worked quite well. Yeah. So, I was just like, oh, you're doing that! Okay. It's like, I've <laughs> I've seen this gambit before, I, I talked about it. Mm-hmm. That you did, lad. So, warmed my heart. <laughs> All right. For those of you not in the know, we are doing a little bit of a format change with Warp Core Breach. Uh, you, you saw the first bit of it last episode, or two episodes ago, when we did our Search for Spock overview and review. But now what we're doing is we're only going to put out Warp Core Breach episodes with the contributors kind of every other week. Two per month is our our goal. And the reason for this is, well, one, there's a little less content coming out from whiz kids uh, but two everyone's just got a lot of stuff going on and our sanity is well needing needing restoration yeah we don't want to pressure people and we, we want quality over quantity yes and, and and that's more important than than rushing a show out every week exactly and i'm sure you appreciate that as much as we do yes so you know, we'd rather, you know, give you the little snippets, the wave reviews, the the OP breakdowns. And if those don't interest you, well, then don't download it. I, you're not going to hurt our feelings. Well, maybe you'll hurt my maybe feelings. A little. Yeah, <laughs> but but not too much. Please listen to us. The, the, the mini-sodes are great for those other times when you're just either you're driving a short hop and you, you don't want that hour long you know, podcast episode and you're just hopping over to the grocery store and back or, or something like that. Or maybe your commute's not quite that long or you just want something light to listen to before nodding off at night. Yeah. You know. But then the, the good side of a full warp core breach episode is going to be that it's going to be a little bit longer. Going to give you more for your money. Yes. Because now we're going to do kind of a question of the week and a top three. <laughs> Say what? Yes, we're doing both. Because we're almost combining two episodes into one. Right. Uh, it's just that all the contributors don't have to do twice the segments. They only have to do one segment, but then they'll have their little minute-long contributions. Which is still a good thing. And uh, this way people don't feel pressured, and if some people want to chime in for both, they do, and if they only have something cool to say for one, then they do, and if they don't have anything to say for either, well, then that's okay. Basically, this is all set up to make life easier on everyone. And who's for that? Come on. Everyone. Well, I hope. Uh, so we're going <laughs> to at least experiment with this for a couple of months, see what it does, and uh, if we decide to change things later, well, then we'll change things later. Uh, but Constantly evolving. We're always open to feedback as well, so let us know. Yeah, let, let us know what you think about it, and, uh, and we'll do it. But this is something we've been debating on for a while, and we want to at least try it and see where it goes. So, without further ado, our question of the week... And our main topic is one that we've debated for a long time. How would you fix or make photon torpedoes more viable in Star Trek Attack Wing? Hmm. Yeah, this is something that uh, has been spawning multiple side conversations back and forth on the forums between David and I all over the place. It's like... Photon torpedoes are like the weapon of choice when it comes to anything other than phasers or disruptors in the Star Trek, you know, universe. Right. So why do they come off to the players as useless? <laughs> well, I think the first step we got to take before we say, well, how do we fix them? We got to take a look at, well, what do we think is wrong with them? 
They're too expensive. Yes. For something that generally on the ships that most people take, you're throwing about the same amount of dice, give or take one on average, uh, but you're having to pay for the upgrade, which is over and above just bringing the ship, and you not only have to do that, but you have to spend an action to put out a target lock, which you have to subsequently spend immediately, and you can only target the ship that is locked as well. So you lose dice quality. So you pay extra points, you spend an action that you cannot use for dice quality, and you throw about the same amount of dice. So why would you bring something that basically brings you no benefit? Now, the benefit that torpedoes do give you in the standard game without anything else is your rear arcs. If you do not have a ship that fires at 360, but you do have a rear arc, the majority of the secondary weapon photon torpedoes will allow you to fire out your rear arc. Uh, so that allows you to fire as you're passing, or if they get behind you, you can take a shot at them. Right, which is a great thing. Mm-hmm. But it's so very conditional. It is. And those dice with no quality, they hurt. Exactly. It's it's like David said earlier, it's like you're throwing seven dice and you get one. That's that's just pain. Yeah. And suffering. Gnashing of teeth, wanting to pick the dice up and throw them out the store. Yeah. I didn't do that. It felt like it, though. Yeah, I'm trying to think of a Star Trek version of Don't Make Me Hungry, but I just can't right now. That that That's how frustrating it that, that makes me feel, thinking of that situation. Uh, it, probably something Khan said. <laughs> the dice, they, they they task me. Yes. Don't make me stab at thee. No, no, Don't no. make me stab at thee. <laughs> They've hurt me, and they wish to go on hurting me. I think that's what, what it is. Yeah. That that's sure. what the well, dice are telling me. We'll let you have that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So here here's at least something I I've mulled over and, and mm-hmm. thought about. I would like it if photons cost the difference between the dice they give you and your primary weapon. Ah. It's not a perfect solution, but it starts to make them a little more palatable in terms of how much they cost so like if you've got a four primary weapon value and and the torpedoes is a five then maybe it costs you two points or something yeah maybe do that plus one that way it's always going to cost you at least one point or just simply say it's a minimum of one point so if you've got a if you're putting it on like say the enterprise e You know, you put photon torpedoes, five and five, you just pay one. Yeah, and then it also can't be reduced by Sakona. Well, yeah, just put in the caveat, there's minimum cost of one. Yeah. Yeah. And and so, that wouldn't be bad. I would pay one point for Enterprise E photon torpedoes. Yep. If I'm not bringing dorsals, I would pay up to two. Sure. Get that that rear factor. Like other ships that don't have that uh, handy ability (laughs) that the E does... You know, but even on like the on, on Deep Space Nine, mm-hmm. okay, photon torpedoes would cost you one point, and then it ties in with the named ability to not disable them. That would start to be worth it. Absolutely. As it is, you don't have much reason to bring photon torpedoes on Deep Space Nine. Yeah. Outside of a very specific scenario. Well. That would lead into another discussion about how to fix Deep Space Nine to make it a little bit more thematic. No, sure. But as I say, that's another topic, another conversation. Okay, but we could inject, yeah. you know, the the Jaeger as a ship. Mm-hmm. You know, th- that one is a very solid ship for what it is. It has no rear arc. It's meant to be a torpedo boat, but it doesn't actually do that job. Uh, right. But if torpedoes cost you two points, because that's the difference between three attack and the five dice for torpedoes, mm. I could see doing that. Spend your action to target, spend your action to target lock, 
use time token torpedoes on that or are the or is that one that doesn't disable if that's one that doesn't disable then we just use disable torpedoes uh anyways we'd go we'd make the jaeger work better if torpedoes were cheaper Mm -hmm. like the thunder child was another ship that was supposedly like a torpedo boat but didn't fit the bill yeah well and and that comes down to cost Mm -hmm. the other thing becomes the ability on torpedoes yes a battle station conversion is a nice thing but that still necessitates rolling a battle station and then what happens if you roll like four battle stations you're just out of luck yeah yeah and the thing is it's like you may convert one battle stations into a critical it's not like you can convert all right like with with a tar- target lock uh required to spend to fire the photon torpedoes the photon torpedo should almost include the target lock reroll ability built into it right like you require the target lock and you must spend it but you also gain its ability at the same time. It just means you can't keep it. Yeah, you... or just simply say you must you must have the target lock to fire it, but you do not need to spend it. So you can spend it if you wish, or you can keep it and use it again on the following turn or subsequent attack. That would make more sense to me. It would, and that would make sense of you already know where your opponent is. You, right. You're firing at them. It, there's no reason you've lost where they are on the battle unless they cloak. Right. So for the sim- most simplistic fix, I would suggest just not requiring the spending of the target lock, just that you have it for that target ship. Yeah. That alone would increase its value. It might not make them, you know, the end all be all killer weapon, but it would make them viable. Keep the battle station to crit conversion on most mm-hmm. of them, and then have that. Yeah, I still think you need a little bit of a cost reduction, but I don't know if you need as drastic of one as we were talking about. Right. It would still be essential to have something, like at least a minus one or something, because they are very expensive for what you're getting. Yeah. I will yeah. say from having played high yield photon resource, I think that's almost ne- necessary for making mm. torpedoes work. One extra die goes a long way and having a reroll helps a lot. And so I think yes. having that target lock would go a long way. Getting mm-hmm. an extra die on top of that would make them better. Mm-hmm. I think if every torpedo across the board was boosted by one attack, that would be a great thing. That would help. Uh, another thing that was mentioned, and I kind of take a little bit further, is photon torpedoes are generally at range 2 to 3 for effectiveness. So that lends us to think, well, why not have primaries limited to range 1 and 2, or have primaries limited in the sense of, you know, at one, they're full strength. At range two, they're reduced. At range three, they're reduced further. So I think that would be grand. It would make a big difference. Yes. And then secondaries don't lose any dice at any range. Well, I don't know about secondaries, but specifically torpedoes wouldn't lose the, the, the power of them. Right, sure. because it it's it's a contained energy form that's not draining as it progresses. Like a phaser or disruptor blast will dissipate over time. I know technically, scientifically, in space, it it just goes and it needs something to reduce it, so it just goes. But as far as the sake of the game and and general concepts, you know, it would be reduced at range. Yeah. Easier to dodge, less impact, dispersal, things like that. I could see that, too. Yeah. I think that's another great way to change the effectiveness of of all that and make the game more interesting, is to keep primaries close. Secondaries can be anywhere from close to long. Yeah. 
Because each needs strengths and weaknesses. And right now, primaries, the only weakness they have is radius. Whether or not you can shoot beyond 90 or 180. And giving an extra defense die at range 3. But that's not enough. Like, Yeah. That's never been a deterrent. For me, it's always, well, who do I need to shoot? Mm -hmm. And then I don't really care about range. Yeah, it's like, do I want to give up dice quality to prevent them from gaining a defense die? Or do I want to keep my dice quality and just give them one extra chance at evading one of my dice? Dice quality usually means in the order of two or three die improvement. So giving them plus one, you're still getting ahead. Yeah, now if you had to give them an evade token at range three... That might change it. It would certainly impact it, but what I said there was based on the assumption that they actually rolled an evade with that extra die. Right. Generally speaking, if you've got dice quality on your attack, you're still going to be ahead of that. Right. I I do understand that. So it's... Yeah. There, there's not enough of a reason not to make whatever attack you were already going to make. Yeah. Like at range one, instead of gaining an attack die, why not Why not either convert a blank or battle station to a hit or convert a hit to a crit? Right? Yeah. Like at one of those. Yeah, and then like, like you said for range three, instead of giving an extra defense die, give them an evade token. Even if one's already there. Or add one evade result to be more accurate. Yeah, I... I don't see a reason why it wouldn't work other than that it eliminates some of the ease of flow of the game and the simplicity of it. But mm -hmm. at that point, you almost have three sets of rules. You have the starter game, you have a normal game, and then you have a tournament game. Right. And at this point, what we're talking about is a tournament game. Yes, and in most cases, that's what we speak of when we talk about the game. Uh, because hardly anybody plays based on starter and casual, you know, is strictly that it's just casual. You can pretty much do what you want. Now, uh, when it comes to anything with hard and fast rules or you're going to be talking about tournament period. And unfortunately there are times when people playing tournament get the other formats mixed into that. Yeah. And that can cause confusion particularly with initiative. Mm. But back to the torpedo angle, you know, they are such an awesome, powerful tool in the Star Trek universe, and we just really, really want them to be useful. We want to bring them, but we just can't justify them. And as we've covered already, the cost is too high to, to not only just to bring them into the game, to equip them to your ship, uh, the cost to use them is extremely high because you've got the, the target lock that doesn't help your quality. You've got the requirement to either disable or discard them depending on which version you're dealing with. But with the basic photons, it's disable. And it's just, it's not viable. So do we have any other ideas? We ha we've had uh, WizKids' idea. They brought out the high-yield torpedoes. So what did that add to the system for us? Well, as I was discussing, you know, it, the extra die helps a lot. Yeah. You know, more than you'd think. And a little bit of quality goes a long way. Mm-hmm. Uh, but you still kind of need more. You need additional quality. You need something where your opponent's shields don't act as effectively. Or mm -hmm. crits do more damage crits that hit shields didn't do shield damage but instead they did hull damage even if it was just regular damage not a crit that could do something and i know that's been brought up by other people mm -hmm. if we had the exploding dice torpedoes as i've been talking about before and that's not an idea unique to me or original to me um, that injects fun but i don't know if that's right for tournament play yeah. Because uh, that can get way too swingy. 
right? Because mm-hmm. uh, then it's down to luck of rolling crits, and then somebody can all of a sudden one-shot your Borg Sphere that has 14 durability, and you're like, yeah, but all you did was roll one torpedo roll, and you rolled so many crits. Um, it just daisy chain. Yeah, and 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 that's great for thematic, for you know hero possibilities. Like you said, it doesn't really function well in the tournament environment. Right, because you know it's one thing if somebody comes up with a, a projected stasis field, knocks you out, and then you get hit with a transphasic torpedo. That you can kind of swallow a little easier than. Would you stop rolling crits already? Just stop it. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> like I'll, I'll do that in a campaign setting. That's fine with me. I just don't want to have that affecting a prize outcome. Right. But I think I think having crits that hit shields carry through to the hole might mm-hmm. might be enough of a shift. Yeah. Uh you know, damage is damage no matter what. And if you think of it that way, but remember, ultimately your goal is to do whole damage. Shields don't matter. Mm -hmm. So maybe? It's something that you would have to be playtested fairly thoroughly to get a good average to see how it impacts the duration and the quality of the games. Yeah, but I'm, you know, I'm in that thought process of... If no one's running torpedoes, let's give people a reason to at least consider running them. Right. Like, flashing back just a little bit to the high-yield photon torpedoes resource, uh, to me, this is something that does not fix the torpedoes, but is is a nice plus. However, it's something that should have almost been an errata to the rules rather than something that you have to pay for to bring. Or something that is free and does not count as your slot, so you can bring it when you want to. If the resource had been free, or if it also discounted every photon torpedo that you brought by one, Mm -hmm. then it would have been the right resource. Yeah. Selfishly, I would have liked to discount them by two, but hey, even one would have been nice. Sure, but even at one, then you have a reason to bring multiple torpedoes in your fleet. Yeah. Uh, because you're like, well, then I'm getting a better discount. You're, mm-hmm. you're not really, but yeah, you're at least making the resource cheaper. I get that they were trying to help the torpedoes, but making it a resource doesn't help because somebody first has to give up another resource that they would otherwise really want to bring, and they have to pay points for this, and they have to spend extra points on those torpedoes. So all the more reason why it shouldn't cost anything. And realistically, if they believed in this resource, they should have made it a rule. Well, and the concern I have is that high yield is going to retire out here, I think, by the end of the year. And then what do you do? Oh, yeah, exactly. So maybe that's the point where they need to reevaluate the photon torpedo factor. Perhaps. And as we just discussed in the last Wave review, WizKids is obviously continually trying to infuse value in the Photon Torpedoes by releasing new cards that have a a positive impact on them. So hopefully by the time that High Yield Photon Torpedoes rolls its way out, we'll be at a better point through WizKids releases where we might actually have more viability in these cards. So it may not even be necessary at that point, but that remains to be seen. Right. It's the great question mark in this game. Mm-hmm. One might call it a Q. Mm, that would be a little on the nose. <laughs> but no matter what it is, Wesley gets the point. <sighs> All right. Well, we're going to now hear how our contributors would fix photon torpedoes. And then... After we hear from them, we're going to transition over to contributor segments. But then we'll be back with our top three. Hi, everyone. And, I'm not uh, card. What would I do there. to make torpedoes more Inspire useful us, and more worthwhile and more widely used? I, to be honest, I think the, the answer is relatively simple. And I think it would simply be a case of saying that uh, A, torpedoes don't disable. And B, whilst you have to have a target lock 
you don't necessarily have to spend it in order to fire. Yes, that makes them a lot better than they are at the moment, and it would make them a replacement for primary weapons in a lot of cases, certainly on low attack ships, but I think if you were to do that, that would mean that people would actually pay the cost to take them, and that is the goal. I know a lot of people have said either one or the other, um, I think if you do both, you will definitely see torpedoes get played more, and I think that would be a good thing, because the show is full of torpedoes being used. So those are my ideas, and that's what I'd suggest. What do I know? I'm not Picard. Hello, this is Stephen Stott with Ready to Play Gaming down in Columbia, South Carolina, here to talk to you today about the question of what would I do to make torpedoes more playable in the game. Well, here's what I propose. I propose that we come up with an upgrade. We could call it Torpedo Enhanced Targeting Systems or something along that line. Anyway, here's how the card works. It would be a five-point card. It would be a card, though, that can be played on any one of your upgrade slots that you want to put it. So it could go as a tech, as a weapon, as a crew upgrade slot. And here's how the card works. During the roll attack dice step, you may disable this card to place a battle station beside your ship. Or you may discard this card to re-roll any number of your attack dice. What this does, as you know, the whole issue with torpedoes is most of the time, you know, unless you get Picard or something like that, or you wait a couple of turns to set up the play to get battle stations or to get something to enhance the roll, that's the problem with torpedoes. Well, what this card does is it allows you either to add a battle station, and this battle station, by the way, could go on any ship that you're playing. So even the Romulans, who don't have a battle station in turn, using this card would allow them, for the, for torpedoes in particular, to have battle stations. And I know Romulans would like that because they they have these those plasma torpedoes that they love to throw out there. So anyway, that, that would be uh, the proposal that I have, is to have an upgrade that would allow for those quality roles. This is Stephen Stott from Ready to Play Gaming down in Columbia, South Carolina, hoping all your roles are hits and evades. You guys have a great day and live long and prosper. Greetings, Warp Core Breach listeners. This is Bane of Borg. Now, you might want to think I would say, oh, do away with the target lock requirement or the disable requirement or even those dreaded time token requirements. But I say this. I say keep all that. The one thing that we can make these tor photon torpedoes a uh, big, huge success would be to let them fire at range 4. Yes, this wouldn't necessitate WizKids putting out commercially available for retail sale a range 4 ruler. Maybe they could even do it with some photon torpedo upgrades. Allowing photon torpedoes to be fired at range 4 would really just make them widely played, more popular than they ever could be. Maybe you could limit to revert you firing at the rear arc at range 3 still, but forward arc range four. I'd like that. This is Vaynerborg signing off. Thank you. Hi, this is Dave Griffin. Today we're talking about how to fix photon torpedoes. As you probably know from reading Board Game Geek, this has been litigated probably hundreds of times. As I have seen it, there are two ways to proceed here. One is uh, to create in photon torpedoes a way to make ships with lower primary weapons better once in a while. Uh, in that regard, what you'd want to do is to eliminate the target lock on photon torpedoes and make them have two time tokens rather than a disable. If you do that, then every other round your ship with a low primary weapon will be firing more dice. The other approach is to make photon torpedoes do something that regular primary weapons can't do. Generally, this revolves around giving them more range or more automatic conversion or some special effect, or making them fire in addition to the primary weapon. Uh, my belief is that 
you're probably better off thinking about a way to make photon torpedoes do something special, like fire at longer ranges. It's tempting to just change them to give low weapon ships more dice once in a while, and I like what they've done with the Kumari's focus particle beam upgrade. Uh, I wouldn't mind if they went that direction, but in order for photon torpedoes to actually get taken by people, I think you've got to make them do something that you need doing that you can't get done better with your primary weapons. Because no matter how good you make photon torpedoes, a ship with five attack dice probably isn't going to use them. Thanks, and I'll see you guys next week. Good evening, and welcome to the Faction Report. The segment that brings you the inside scoop on all the factions. We'll show you how they really work, expose their weaknesses, find innovative combinations, and help you make them work better. And now here's your host, the man who is not Picard, David Walton. Hi everyone, I'm not Picard and this is the Faction Report. I thought I'd have a look at the way that the different factions play as regards early game and late game. Now, early game is the first one or two turns and the first engagement. And it's in this part of the game where you're looking to do a lot of damage. Um, if you do enough damage, you can avoid taking damage back. And that perhaps helps the more fragile ships and the more fragile fleets. Um, but basically, any fleet that requires upgrades that discard or particular situations to occur where you're looking to make a really big impact early in the game. It's the kind of fleet that kind of motors four forward on turn one and then four forward on turn two, ready to get your opponent in their sights and blow them away. And I thought a fleet that does this really, really well are Klingons. Uh, Klingons are the ultimate in the uh, glass cannon fleet, and I get the feeling that Klingons are a fleet that... Uh, benefits from being able to do as much damage as possible in the early game. And interestingly, another fleet that really does well in the early game are Bajorans. If you're running several interceptors, all with phaser strike, uh, you're running Kira, who gives you the ability to hand out target locks, and you've got Blockade, uh, which is discard to add plus one attack, plus one defense, and Militia, which is a discard that adds plus two attack dice in a, a battle stations. Having that early game high captain skill, kind of alpha strike, being able to take out your opponent's ship, I think is a really important thing and a really good idea for Bajorans. Now, fleets that do well in the late game, that's either fleets that kind of need to whittle down the opponent's abilities, weather the storm of those discards early on in the game, and be able to kind of return fire and return damage later on in the game are either fleets like the Borg which have a great deal of durability and lots of options for increasing that durability uh, namely Borg Ablative Hull Armour not that you can really play it in the 53 suggested play format but it's certainly something that you have if you're playing casually or if you're playing outside of those suggested play format rules um, but also fleets that rely on board control and rely on being out of arc and not allowing your opponent to fire them and the, those fleets that do really well in that I think the the prime example is Romulans Cloak Mines are an excellent card for the late game doing one or two damage to an opponent who has full hull and shields in turn one and turn two is not going to make a huge difference to the game as a whole but when they've lost those shields and when they are perhaps unable to regain damage because they've got rid of their Bukar or whatever healing upgrades that they've got, doing one or two damage that might be critical to their hull can win you the game. That's without taking into account the fact that Cloak Mines have a very good effect at controlling board space and forcing your opponent to play in particular areas. Romulans are perhaps the ultimate late game fleet. Federation as with most things, are a fleet that can play in the early game and in the late game. They don't seem to have any cards that are particularly geared towards early game or late game because a lot of their extra action and extra attack ability cards that they have um, are not discards or even disables. One card I'd say which is typical for the Federation in terms of a 
card that works well in the early game and the late game is Montgomery Scott from the original Enterprise pack, which is being re-released. Um, so you can get a hold of it. In the early game, you can use him to drop shields to increase your attack dice. And in the late game, you can use him to drop attack dice to improve your shields, to perhaps survive a little longer and win that kind of grind that happens in the late game. So when you're building fleets and when you're thinking about which faction to play, think to yourself, am I playing a game that is com primarily concerned with winning early and avoiding the game going on too long? Or do I want to play a build or do I want to play a faction which works better in the late game that has the durability to survive a lot longer, that isn't relying on really high quality attacks that you get perhaps one or two shots at? Uh, or do I want to do both? And if I want to do both, I'm probably going to play Federation. Just some ideas from me. Uh, I've written a number of blog posts on this. You can find my blog at notpicard.blogspot.com. I encourage you to read there. Uh, all of my ideas on there are my own, and feel free to disagree with them. I mean, what do I know? I am not Picard. Thanks very much for listening. Hello, players. I think it's time for a could use in the form of retail card packs. I don't mean packs without a ship model like the OPs. I'm talking about card packs that don't have a ship at all. Sort of like the Temple Cold War grand prize cards. Things that we can just plug right into our fleets. Firstly, and slightly off topic, I'd love to see packs of generics. Say each faction gets a pack of their non-unique cards and tokens. And then we don't always have to buy multiples of ships. Back on topic, these packs will hold cards for new things. So let's go to Season 10 of TNG and build a mostly Thieves pack from the episode Starship Mine. Let's start with Fed, and no, no new Picard. Our captain, kind of, will be Calvin Hutchinson, the master of small talk. Three points, skill two, Fed unique. You may assign this card to a ship as a crew upgrade. If you do so, no captain effects can be applied to this card. At any time, you may disable this card to target a ship at range one and disable one crew upgrade assigned to it. If assigned to your ship as a captain, every time you remove a disabled token from this card, increase this card's captain skill by plus one to a max of five. Then we have Mott, the all-knowing barber. Crew, two points, fed unique. Immediately after you reveal your maneuver dial, you may discard this card to change the speed of the maneuver by one. The new maneuver must be on your dial and not be a red maneuver. Now we can get to our rogues. Kelsey, crew, four points, indie unique. During the Gathering Forces phase, you may deploy one Elite Talent upgrade with a printed cost of three or less face down beneath this card for free. If your ship's captain is discarded, this card becomes your new captain at skill 5. Immediately deploy any Elite Talent under this card to your ship. You may then immediately perform a battle station as a free action. Her action, discard your captain. Or, action, discard an upgrade on your ship to perform its action, even if it's disabled. You may then perform an action from your action bar as a free action. If the upgrade is disabled, remove any tokens before discarding it and performing its action, then place two time tokens on this card. Devor, looking just like Tuvok, is a crew three points into unique. Action, discard this card to target a ship at range one that is not cloaked. Disable up to two upgrades on the target ship. Kiros is two points into unique. Action, discard this card to target ship at range one that is not cloaked. Place an auxiliary power token beside the target ship. Disable the captain of the target ship if possible. Sattler, two points into unique. If a ship within range one is placing a disabled token on an upgrade, or removing a disabled token from an upgrade, you may immediately discard this card to prevent the ship from doing so. The target ship does not recover its spin to action. Pomet, two points into unique. When applying a critical damage to your hull, instead of applying the effects of the damage, you may immediately place three time tokens on this card to flip the crit over, or discard this card to cancel the crit completely. Orton, two points into unique. Disable this card to target a ship within range 1 to 3. The target ship receives no range bonuses this round, even if provided by ship or upgrade text. And then, the lone tech for our pack. The unstable Trilithium Resin. Four points, Federation Independent Dual Faction. At the start of the game, place six mission tokens on this card. Whenever you reveal a speed greater than two, remove one mission token from this card. If there are no mission tokens to remove, roll one attack die instead. On a critical result, immediately destroy your ship. 
You may spend one mission token each round to either roll plus one defense die each time you defend that round, or immediately after revealing your maneuver to increase your speed by one. The new maneuver must be on your dial and treat it as a white maneuver. There's an action. Action, you may move this card to another ship at range one that has no active shields, even if it exceeds that ship's restrictions. You're literally carrying a bomb and it's ticking. So let's play Hot Potato. And that's our first card pack build. Uh, there are more card packs waiting to be built from the Trek universe, so let us know what you'd like to see and how these cards do for you. And always keep thinking outside that box. Hi, this is Dave Griffin. Today we're talking about the mission called the Siege. It came with the Ratosha, that's the Bajoran scout ship, and it recreates the DS9, the Circle, and the Siege two-part episode. The Federation starts with 30 points, including one ship with a hull three or less, uh, and the Bajoran start with 90 points with at least one scout ship and all ships hull three or less, which gives you any Bajoran ship. And they can only have crew upgrades, so presumably just the ships and crew, although it doesn't say that you can't have resources, and you'll probably need something like a flagship or fleet captain to, to get more points into the ship. Now, uh, there's a planet in the center. DS9 is four inches from the north end centered, and that's the token, not the big token that came with the uh, Dominion War, but uh, a little objective token. There's one of them has DS9 on the other side. And uh, the Federation start at the north edge near DS9, although they can start anywhere on that edge, and the Bajorans start on the south edge. The special rules are key to this mission. Uh, the first one is that you put one mission token on DS9 and 11 on the side of the board. At the end of each turn, in the end phase, you take one token from the side of the board and place it on DS9. That's going to represent the Federation's forces for the final battle on DS9. You have to have a lot of those tokens there to win, which means either delaying the Bajoran forces or destroying some of them. When all of the Bajoran ships have been destroyed or they have docked, which I'll tell you about in a minute, then at the end of that turn, the battle for DS9 begins. And the Bajorans have a new special action which they can use when they're range 1 of DS9. But remember, if the uh, Bajoran ships bump the token, I don't think they get their action, so that's something you should remember. Anyway, the special action just basically, dis you disable your captain and your crew, and they're considered to be on DS9. You could put away team markers on them too if you wish. Now depending on how many crew the Bajoran ships manage to deliver to DS9 and how many tokens have accumulated there is going to tell you what's going to happen in the final battle of DS9. The way that works is each token represents basically one fighter and each crew or captain on the the DS9 from the Bajoran ships represent one fighter. What you do is you roll attack die, one for each fighter on both sides simultaneously, and the number of hits or crits you roll kill that number of tokens on the other side. If you both die simultaneously, whoever started out with fewer people on DS9 is the one who wins. Otherwise, the one that has people left wins. It's a little bit like the uh, arena... OP, if you remember that. Now, uh, the objectives are to win the DS9 battle. Uh, for the Bajorans, three ships seems to be optimal. Two ships, you can't carry enough people. Three ships, you don't have the points for enough people. Flagship's good for bumping up the points. You're probably going to be lucky if you even get to 80 points. Uh, and your best option is to run for the station. You're probably thinking you could just destroy the Federation ship. You could probably do it with the three ships you're going to have. But by the time you do that and get to DS9, you're going to end up with a lot of tokens on DS9. And even though you deliver your full crew, you're probably still going to die in the battle for DS9. On the Federation side, you do not have enough points to win this mission. It's unbalanced against the Federation. With 30 points, and a hull three or less, you can't get enough attack die to destroy one of those ships, and it almost has to be a scout ship like the Aquarium of the Ratosha before it gets to DS9. 
if they play defensively and give themselves an evade token and maybe even to battle stations, which is certainly possible for both scout ships, especially if they got one of them on the flagship, the only way you're going to win is if you have more points. So I recommend you allow the Federation to have 40 rather than 30 points. If you find that's too much, you can back it off. But frankly, I think to have a chance, you need to have the Federation have five attack die, and that means you got to load upgraded phasers and Type 8 phasers on there and a good captain so you can move last. But even with a good, tight 40-point build, it's not, an, it's not a foregone conclusion for the Feds. If you give them less, even if you give them like 35, 36 points, the Federation is probably only going to win if they play exceptionally well or get really lucky. So the unbalance is why I'd rate this uh, only two stars. If you give the Federation more points, I'd move it up to three stars and say it's worth playing. Now, it does tend to favor good maneuvering, but uh, which is something I like in a mission. But uh, they did sort of fail to balance it. And if you don't sort of have the, the good strategies in mind, you know, anything can happen. If the Bajoran player messed around and started shooting at you, you might be able to delay them long enough so that by the time they got to the station there were nine or ten tokens on there and you'd probably win. But if you play the optimal strategy, which is for the Bajorans, three ships and get to the station as soon as possible, then the Federation is going to need help to win. So have fun with this one and uh, let me know how you do. I'll see you next week. And now it's time for the Warp Core Breach Top 3. We count them up from 3 to 1, and then we toss it over to our contributors, so you get the best bang for your buck. This episode's top 3, Top Factions for Learning or Teaching Star Trek Attack Wing. So, what we mean by this can be interpreted by you in any which way, but for me, it's like which factions would be the the most conducive to teaching someone the game in a way that they get enough of a sampling of how the game works without overwhelming them. Right. So, uh, for me, it's also, give me a faction that showcases something about the game, but doesn't overwhelm, like you said. Um, but also gives them... Something good cross section, yeah, a good cross section. So, for instance, Ferengi would not be a great faction to learn with because, despite what they have, and I think they have some interesting things, they just don't have enough punch to them. Well, even if you were to balance them out and put them in the same playing field, Ferengi just suffer from sameness, they have one class of ship. And then a shuttle. Yeah. That's it. There's no variety to it other than uniqueness. So that alone is not enough to get a new player excited either. And that's another point with the factions. You want them to be excited about it, interested. It's like, ooh, cool. Right? Yeah. I th That is the thing. It, it's kind of a what factions interest people, grab your attention and make you go, oh, that's cool. Mm-hmm. And uh, that kind of leads me into my number three pick, which is Species 8472. Mm. There's not a huge amount of variety in them in the sense of character, but they're powerful. They've got cool maneuvers. They've got interesting cards. So it's something that would be a great way to get them into the game right away. It's got the maneuver uh, dial has got the variety so you can train them on that and they're just cool ships and they look neat and they're not exactly villains and they're not exactly heroes so they might appeal to a wide variety of star trek fans that way or even non-star trek fans yes well and who doesn't love rolling six attack dice exactly and having some defense dice to actually take a punch Right. It's not like you're rolling zero or one. You at least get those two. Three at range three. Yes. So, Species is also on my list. I, I actually pulled a U. I don't quite have a list. So, I'll call 
or I don't quite, don't have a ranking. <laughs> don't quite have a ranking. Uh, so so I'll give species the number three slot, but on a different day it could be two or one easily. Uh, yeah. So yeah, I I love species. I love what they have. Yes, it's only that one model, but uh, now between Alpha Beta and Omega, there are so many different play styles that those ships offer that Mm -hmm. yeah some of them might be subtle but there's still something cool to give a new player that's like hey if you roll two crits you can uh flip those over and you can rotate my ship 180 and they're like oh that sounds cool yeah and now they have something to gun for and even if they don't win they can say, hey, remember that time I rotated your ship 180 and then you had to fly off the board? <laughs> you spin me right round, baby, right round like a bio ship. <laughs> exactly. And and if you do that, then they have their own little sense of accomplishment. And that yeah. means everything. With new players, you want to create memories. You want positive memories where they're going to go, hey, this really neat thing happened. You know, as opposed to one new player... Uh, I played with him as the Defiant and me as the Gorportus. I'd never actually played the Breen before. Little did I realize how discouraging the energy dampening weapon would be to a new player. It's like, oh yeah, you lose your attack, you drift, and you basically just suck more damage and attack and can do nothing. That's not fun. So I highly recommend you do not you know, play a Breen energy dampening weapon against them. Yeah. Maybe you can let them play it on you. <laughs> right. Again, that's a sense of accomplishment. That would right. Be cool. Right. So yeah, make sure you balance it at the same time. Like you can give them the overpowered or, or the funky shenanigans, but you shouldn't be taking them yourself. Right. Although if you're trying to pull off that weird combo that never quite seems to work, yeah, mm-hmm. there's worse times to try something. <laughs> True enough. <laughs> All right, so what's your number two? My second choice is independent. Mm. Reason being, there's a huge variety. There's lots of options, characters, uh, different play formats, different ships with abilities. There's so much variety in independent, there's almost a limitless supply of choice. and you can play so many of them and they play well. Even, even the ships that are a little weaker on one side and stronger in other, they still play well against the other opposites within that faction. I can see that. And who doesn't love the alpha hunter? Right. That's what I'm getting at. That alpha hunter is amazing for new people. Teaches them the value of sensor echo. Yeah. And shows some good stat lines. Independents don't have super high powered offense, but they have a good mm-hmm. balance of stuff. So, yeah, even I, yeah, I, I can buy that. And the Valjean uh, that has both forward and rear arc, as opposed to its blind counterpart, the Gavroche, yes. with only a ninety forward. <laughs> <laughs> it's and, not a bug; it's a feature. <laughs> exactly, and it's actually uh, canonically explained as well. The rear torpedo launcher was something that was added uh, by Bailana, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, so it's a neat little throw-in. you know. And yeah, it's only got two attack dice primary, but it's got three evade, so it means it's something that's got the potential to survive. And if you're playing two raiders against each other, that's a pretty good mix. Lower attack, higher agility... You've got a little bit of staying power, so you're not going to obliterate each other in one pass. And that that's another thing that you don't want in your first game with a new player. Is you don't want either one of you to just end the game in one w- weapon salvo. You want to have a little bit of back and forth. It's like, for those of you that enjoy watching tennis, you know, if it was just over with one volley... You wouldn't. You would never watch. It'd be boring. You want the back and forth. You want the bop, bit, bop, bit, bop. You want that to build up. You need that. Oh yeah, the thirty shot rallies are some of the most exciting <laughs> things that happen in tennis. <laughs> Just throw a little trek on that Borg versus McEnroe. <laughs> wow, I don't even yes. know how to transition to that, but I'm gonna give you my number two pick, which is Borg. <gasps> so I, I I really considered putting Borg at number one, but the only reason it knocks it down is because Borg don't 
tell you how to maneuver all that well. Yeah, they teach you a, almost like a, a slightly different game because they're so unique. They don't teach you how to play anything else but board. But here's what they do. They show you how valuable proper ship placement is. Yes. And that is a valuable lesson to learn. And I think that it's a lesson that once you understand it, it makes you a better pilot and it teaches you how to maneuver your ships in different ways, no matter what you're playing. Um, Right. Because one thing I've seen a number of players that are extremely good at the tactical side of things, where both in fleet building and combos and how to use their cards, but they aren't necessarily as good at the actual piloting of their ships. Like they don't quite get them to land where they want them to be or flying formation. They can't get their ships to meet up the way they want. So it's very important to learn piloting skills. And David, you're absolutely right. The board definitely help there. Right. And, and if anything, they show you the value of not, always jousting right and maybe you have to play against them sometimes to to truly Mm -hmm. learn that but i think there's a, a give and take there that really does show you an important lesson that you can't learn with any other faction Mm. you want to know another perk of uh letting new players play borg theme well i think tim the toolman taylor said it best (laughs) <laughs> you're giving them the uberest, arguably the most powerful faction in the game to start, and they can go around going, hey, hey, hey I'm the Borg, I'm going to get you. You know, like, they're new. You know, you don't want them to feel discouraged. And when you give them something significant and powerful, especially if it's in proportion to what you're bringing, they're going to feel pretty good, I would think. Yeah. Yeah. I would. I would say so. Mm-hmm. It's like ev- even the Borg Sphere, which isn't quite as significant in physical size as the tactical cube on the table, it's still pretty impressive against most other uh, WizKids ships. Yeah. This giant ball facing off against these little ships with like little little le- spindly leg nacelle things, you know, going around, going, ah, I'm warping around. Oh, this big sphere is coming at me. You know, it's intimidating. And to be on the side of power is definitely a plus for a new player. Yeah. Build their ego. No, I, I like it. I, yeah, I, I'm, I'm with you on the board. So, uh, what is your number one faction? My top pick for, uh, faction to train a new player on would be Klingon. And my reasoning for this is, it, as I said before, it's very simple faction. They're very powerful. They have, you know, a very consistent maneuverability. So from one ship to the next, to the next, to the next, there's virtually no difference. So you don't have to go, oh, shoot, how does this ship move again? You don't have to keep referring back to all their different maneuver cards. They're essentially all the same. The only real variance is whether, you know, the the, the two banks are white, white or green. Really? Yeah. Like you, you get your, your, your green straight ones, you get your four straights, you get your banks, you get your turns and you get your red come about. So you actually have the ability to teach them how that works and not every ship has a come about. So you're going to want to make sure that your players know how that works. Right. And you've got the cloak option, so you can show them how that works, both in evading and you know taking advantage of the other player. Uh, you've got the the powerful nature where the ships start around damage four and and go up to five for the better ones, um, not counting the original series, of course. Um, and you've got great upgrades from secondary weapons to to tech and crew that are very flavorful, but realistically Klingon ships do not require a swarm of upgrades to make each ship effective. Sometimes all you need is a ship and a good captain and maybe one crew like Pah, Worf, Drex or Nagarin. 
something like that is very clean very simple and best of all it doesn't take a lot of head processing to know how it works and to implement it when you're playing it and that's another important factor with new players is you don't want to overwhelm them with too much timing and combos and reactions when this happens do this and so on you want to give it a natural flow from a to b to c not having to go back and do this and go forward and do that just keep it simple yeah and that's what i love about the klingons they are simple more often than not at least <laughs> no offense klingon guys <laughs> Well, Klingons have that pretty consistent nature of I'm here to attack you and kill you and I'm not going to do it with a ton of fancy tricks outside of projected stasis field. I'm just here to kill you. Mm -hmm. have, but at least projected stasis field is honorable in the sense of like, I'm going to knock out your shields, but I'm going to lower mine at the same time. Yeah. And I'm going to roll less attack dice. Right. With this ship. <laughs> right. But, uh, yeah. Uh, Klingons are also my number one choice. There's not anything else that conveys the elegance of the game, the straightforwardness of the game, better than Klingons. Absolutely. You know, other factions have more tricks. Other factions... Might have more interesting ships. Yeah. Have more yeah. ships, have more variety, have more interesting captains. Might have your favorite XYZ character, but yeah. But Klingons have really good ships that, uh, that do a lot of things for you. And why wouldn't you is kind of the question now. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the one thing that uh, should be mentioned is that of these factions, uh, there there's not a lot of the whole um, battle station scan ac actions going on with some of these. It it varies with, with a lot of the ships, and some of these, especially the ones with the cloaks, they lose some of those actions. So in that sense, it might be a little bit of a detriment. But there again, the Klingons... They do have that relatively under control with the right upgrades. Yes. Well, especially now with uh, Admiral Galron. Right. The Klingon Mendak. Yes. Only slightly different. <laughs> slightly more effective, too. Yeah. So there you go. For us, it's uh, Klingons at one, Species at three, and uh, Borg for me, Independent for Nick. Some good choices. Go out there and train people. Assimilate, assimilate, assimilate. Wait, don't you mean exterminate? No, because then you don't have anybody to play. Mm. You want to assimilate them. Infect them with the awesomeness that is this game. Sounds like a bad cold. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we kid. Alrighty. Uh, contributors, tell us your top choice. That's what we'd like to know. Can you show us? Hi, this is Dave Griffin. Today we're talking about what faction to use to teach a new player the game. Uh, to me, the answer is probably the Klingons. Now, the Klingons have been somewhat neglected by whiz kids in uh, recent waves, but the Klingons are still uh, a relatively easy action to uh, easy faction to teach because their strategies are more simple and their ships are less upgraded and the more upgraded your ship is the easier it is to lose track of its capabilities so despite the fact that uh, they're not quite as strong a faction as they used to be in the early days of the game the Klingon faction is relatively easy to put in front of a new player and let him uh, do a decent job of playing them. Uh, if you're playing a new player, you might want to give him a few extra points, though, and uh, there isn't a better introduction to the game than the Kobayashi Maru scenario. So if you're an experienced player, take the feds, give them the Klingons, and even though the feds are in a little bit better shape these days because of all the upgrades they've gotten, 
it'll still be hard to uh, to win the Kobayashi Maru as the experienced player, and it's always nice to give the, a new player a chance to win on his first round if you can. Thanks, and I'll see you next week. Hey everyone, it's Natasha from Dude, It's Just a Game. If I could use one faction to teach people how to play this game, it would be Species 8472. I really enjoy playing with Species. I think they're a great faction with a lot of really positive aspects. So this would be the faction that I would choose to teach someone to play with. Um, For one, it limits their choices enough that they can feel confident about the ship they're choosing, but it also gives them enough choices of upgrades to make it really feel like their own. On top of that, species ships are extremely durable, so even if their first couple builds aren't super great in terms of synergy and the ship working, uh, it's possible it will just survive by pure brute force. So for those reasons, I think a species is a really great place to start, And I think that that's a faction that I will use to introduce anybody to this game. Uh, That's it for me. Thanks for listening. Hello, this is Stephen Stott with Ready to Play Gaming down in Columbia, South Carolina. Here to talk to you about today's question, which is, what faction would I use to teach a new player stall? Quick answer to that would be the Federation. The reason why I would use Federation is because it has, like, say, the Defiant, and along with a couple other ships that I can use that give you almost the full variance of how a person would play the game with the movement dials, with the uh, capabilities of the ships, using actions. The Federation is just set up really well to handle the full gambit of all that and to include cloaking capabilities and such. So that is the faction I would use. Obviously... Uh, my backup faction would be my favorite faction, the Vulcans, uh, and I would use them as well because they have their movement dial is such that it provides for a good variance of opportunities of styles of movement, strategies, and such. But Federation is my main group. This is Steve Stop from Ready to Play Gaming down in Columbia, South Carolina, hoping all your dice rolls are hits and evades. Live long and prosper. This is Big John out of the Klingon boarding party coming from South Florida in Denton Beach, playing out of Da Vinci Dreamworks 2. And my favorite faction to teach a new player the game has always been Federation. It's just a, a big part of the game has been Federation. A big part of the draw is the Federation. And I usually try and tailor the new player experience to very small ships, very few upgrades possibly just a single ship so that they can focus their attention on trying to learn the basics of flight, dials, actions, and each of the different phases of the game. Thank you very much, and Kapla. Greetings, Warp Core Breach listeners. This is Bane of Borg with Favorite Faction to Teach a New Player to Learn the Game. My favorite faction to start off new players using is the Federation. Primarily because there is no cloaking, so you don't have to get into that mechanic right away. But there is the battle stations action, which I think is a good one to learn, easy one to learn. The uh, other reason would be the familiarity with most people with Federation, the ship Enterprise, and the captains Kirk and Picard, I think is an easy way to break someone in on the new game. Also, a lot of the Federation ships have a good movement dial. You get a lots of different uh, movement, variety of movement. So I think uh, just for the ease of learning the game, often I start off with Federation and maybe just a Federation and a captain on a ship and we learn to move and shoot and then we later on add some crew and do some actions. So I guess this is my contribution for Bane of Borg signing off. Thank you. Hi everyone, not Picard here. I think the obvious faction to tell, to teach people how to play the game with would be Federation uh, for a number of reasons. They have access to majority of the actions on the action bar, they have cloaking devices which means you can teach people how to use cloaked ships, um, they have the greatest flexibility of upgrades and that kind of thing. I think the problem with teaching people to play the game using Federation is because Federation have so many of those upgrades and have so many of those um, advantages the other factions don't necessarily have you are setting them up to fail in the long run and for that reason I, I'm almost tempted to say you should teach people to play the game using Ferengi uh, they still have access to battle stations with a number of upgrades the ships are average if that's probably not true they're 
probably less than average but um, they have reasonable manoeuvring dials they have reasonable captain skills you can teach them to play the game the basic mechanic of the game using Ferengi and then when they've got the basics of the game they can pick up another faction which they can perhaps do better with which they can perhaps play the game better with and uh, it might be a better learning experience for them if they don't start with the very best from the start so there you go a faction I would teach new players to play the game with is despite all of the evidence to the contrary Ferengi hello everyone it's Matt here aka Omicron bringing greetings from Gulf Ontario Canada the faction I would choose to teach or introduce the game to new players would be the Klingon Empire that should not come to a surprise to any of my fellow style players in Guelph, as I am affectionately called Klingon Matt. In fact, I spent the first several OPs playing as Klingons. While I had mixed results, I gained more experience playing as Klingons than any other faction. But Matt, everyone knows the Federation is so much better. Well, while the Federation has a very warm heart in my place, I do have to agree right out of the starter box. If you teach someone using Klingons, you can basically teach them everything in the game. You can teach them about cloaking, sensor echoes, the importance of piloting maneuvers and weapon arcs, and most importantly, you can illustrate the heartbreak one suffers when you whiff while rolling six defense dice. You can also teach them about making crew and tech choices that matter, since we all know Klingon ships don't have the best slot allotment in the galaxy. Finally, and most importantly, you can teach them about one of the key things in the game and out of the game. The one thing that truly drives a Klingon. Honor. Hopefully, if you focus on the right things, by the end of the gaming session, your new attack wing player will be saying, Today is a good day to die. Not to themselves, but to the player across the table from them. Couple off, my friends. Alrighty, final thoughts. Well, now that we've gotten our Wave 24, we've got a bit of a month off, so to speak, until we get a full release. It's almost two months, but in between we have the uh, the oversized board cube with Sphere coming out. Indeed. And we have OP3 of the classic movie series coming for June. So we actually get four new things in June. We get uh, the Bounty, the Enterprise A, the new Oversized Cube, and the new Sphere. So it's really not that thin at all, is it? No, in fact, it's more stuff than we're going to get at any other point this year. Really? Yes. Well, isn't that equivalent? Because that's four ships, right? Yes. So if we have a tournament a month... We've got a ship in a month plus a wave of three. Yeah. So on the on months, we'll be getting four. But then again, this is a month where you get an oversized freaking cube. <laughs> That's what I was getting at. <laughs> it just don't get any bigger than this. Until WizKids decides to release the Unimatrix. <laughs> I'm like... I don't have room for anything much bigger. It's called It Is the Playmat. <laughs> I I mean, I guess. I could maybe have... I guess I could have room for a Doomsday Machine that was about... Larger? Two feet long or so. Large enough to actually gobble up ships? Ooh, that would be fun. Oh, yeah. My opponents might not like that, but... <laughs> I wonder what it would take for me to 3D print something that size. Uh, more time, more money, and... Uh... Oh, it's not about the money so much as just the time to figure out how to print it in pieces and huh. connect them later. Legos. <laughs> <laughs> Lego for the win! Or you need, like, you know how um, miniature train tracks go together? Mm. You need some kind of interlocking connection system. Yeah. That was one thing that always bothered me as a child and a young adult and now an adult is we've never had official Lego branded Leg Star Trek Lego. 
Yeah. Lego branded Star Trek. It's always been off brands. Creo. Like we've got Star Wars. Yeah. Didn't we have Tyco at one point? Isn't there a Tyco Enterprise? Probably. I'm not sure. There was something other. Or me, there was Mega Blocks. Yeah, there was a Mega Blocks oh, one at one point. Yeah. Yeah. I don't understand why. I, I mean, I get that Star Wars is a little more popular, or a lot more popular. But... It's got the marketing angle down pat, so there's money to be had. Yeah. But um... Star Trek is there. It exists. There is a niche, granted, but it's a big niche. I mean, Star Trek made good money with the, the action figures and the yep. the set location pieces and stuff mm-hmm. like that. So I still Playmates have some did of that goodness stuff. day. Yeah. yeah I, who knows? <laughs> One day, perhaps. Yeah. Who knows? I, we can always hope. <laughs> but in the meantime, WizKids is releasing us new ships, new goodies, new cards, with some repaints, some re-releases. So keep your shelves stocked. So introduce your pl- your new players to those old ships that you otherwise could not get. Put that value in into the game. Keep Wiz Kids happy that way so that they keep putting out new ships. So that we go 2016 and beyond. Yes. I want my Sona. That was a little shout out to Star Trek Beyond. <laughs> I got you. And and a little bit of Buzz Lightyear. <laughs> Never hurts to have Buzz Lightyear anywhere. Warp <laughs> core breach in ten. Alrighty. Nine. But that's gonna wrap eight, it up for us. Thank seven, you guys for listening. Six. Five. And until next time. Four. This is Nick. Three. And this is David. Two. Ejecting, ejecting the core. Warp core ejected. Warp core breach is produced by Nick Norris and David Montgomery, with additional content from our contributors. Our computer is voiced by Corinne Donnelly. Warp Core Breach is not endorsed, sponsored, or affiliated with CBS Studios Incorporated or the Star Trek franchise. All Star Trek trademarks and logos are owned by CBS Studios Incorporated. All sound files are used under Creative Commons 3.0 by attribution. For specifics, please visit our Facebook page by searching Warp Core Breach Podcast. If you want to contribute to the show, let us know on the Facebook page or you can email us at warpcorebreachpodcast at gmail.com. A little bit of late input here. Uh, WizKids just released Wave 27 solicitation, and we've got the Enterprise-E reprint, the Groth reprint, but the exciting bit is the Orsassin expansion pack, and that's a Zindi reptilian ship, just like the Diaspora. Uh, so that'll be coming out in November. Also, we have names for the three months of Klingon Civil War. No word on the prizes, but month one is Attack on Gowron. Month two is Battle of Mempa, and month three is Baiting the Romulans. So that'll be interesting, gives us kind of an idea of what's coming up, and uh, always nice to see more info.